Well, good morning, everyone. I am truly honored to be here with all of you this morning, even though there's a, a screen separating us. John and Debbie are uh, two of my biggest cheerleaders, and uh, they've been such uh, an encouragement to me over the years. I've been very blessed to have them in my life. John is one of my uh, mentors in ministry. Uh, he teaches me how to be a good youth pastor. And so I'm so thankful for them. I'm so blessed to call them my friends. Now before I begin, uh, I want to give a little shout out to another family uh, who I hear is a part of this church community, and that is the Vanden Bogards, uh, Hank and Debbie. Now, they've been a part of my life since I was a child. They were the Sunday school directors at the church my family and I attended way back in the day. I'm really good friends with their daughter, Courtney, and so I spent a lot of time at their house. And I'm sure that they could tell you one or two embarrassing stories about me, though I hope they don't. Hank and Debbie were two of the first people to teach me about Jesus, about who he is and how much he loves me. They've had a profound impact on my life and my faith, and I just wanted to take a moment to say hello and to say thank you. So John tells me that you are currently going through the Gospel of Matthew. How exciting. Last week, if you tuned in, you would have heard John teach about the character of God through the parable of the vineyard workers and the story of the two blind men whom Jesus healed. John focused on God's compassion and grace and encouraged us to press into him for sight. This week, we get to dig into the Gospel of Matthew chapter 20, verse 20 to 28, where Jesus actually challenges the worldly mindset of the disciples and teaches them what true greatness looks like in the kingdom of God. So we have here the first biblically recorded helicopter parent. As Jesus and his disciples are on their way to Jerusalem, James and John's mother, who is traveling with them at this time, goes over to talk to Jesus. She kneels before him and asks that he would grant her a favor, which isn't unheard of since at this time most people were asking favors of Jesus. But this request was different. She asked Jesus to grant her sons a place of honor in his kingdom. And not just a place of honor, but the prominent places of honor. Now it's likely that going to Jesus with this request wasn't entirely her idea. In fact, there's some evidence to suggest that it was James and John who sort of nudged her to ask Jesus for this favor. Though I'm, I'm sure that she was happy to oblige. Now this speaks directly to James and John's mindset at the time and their underdeveloped understanding of who Jesus is. Jesus says to James and John's mother, you don't know what you're asking. And then turns to James and John who are standing there with their mother and asks them, are you able to drink from the bitter cup of suffering I'm about to drink? Without missing a beat. They say, yes, of course I can. Have you ever said yes to something without knowing what you were saying yes to? I've done it more times than I'd like to admit. I once said yes to running a half marathon with my cousin and quickly regretted my decision when I started to train for it. I didn't realize all that was required of me, the sacrifices that I was going to have to make, the sore muscles that I would have to endure and the amount of time that I had to invest in order to get myself even remotely ready to complete the marathon, to cross the finish line. Now, I'm happy to report that I did cross the finish line. It wasn't pretty, but I did it, and that's what matters. 
I can hear some of you clapping in your living rooms. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sometimes we are quick to say yes to things without counting the cost, without fully understanding what's required of us. We can become so fixated on the destination that we forget there's a journey that we must make first in order to get there. And often the destination that we arrive at turns out to be different than what we expected. At this time, James and John have an idea in their minds about what the kingdom of God is and what their life is going to look like once that kingdom is established. I think that part of the reason Jesus asked them this question was to kind of snap them back into reality. See, the ancient prophets Isaiah and Jeremiah spoke darkly about the cup of Yahweh's wrath. Now, it's safe to say they weren't talking about a splash of Welsh's grape juice in a little plastic cup, but rather the holy wrath of God poured out against all those who commit evil, injustice, and wrongdoing. The cup Jesus speaks of here is the suffering and the crucifixion that he will soon face in which the holy wrath of God will actually be poured out on him. Something that we as Christ followers will never have to know because of Jesus. Jesus does make mention of the fact that James and John will indeed face suffering of their own. James will be one of the first disciples to be martyred and John will be forced to live in exile. But Jesus explains that he is under the authority of the Father who is the one who makes decisions about leadership in his kingdom. Rewards in the kingdom of God are not granted as favors, but are given to those who faithfully serve Jesus. The other ten disciples overhear the conversation, and they become angry with James and John, and not likely for honorable reasons, but rather because they got to Jesus first. Their reaction to what they overheard reveals the mindset of the other 10 disciples, which isn't different than that of James and John. Now what we have to remember here is that at this point, the disciples were still figuring things out. They were still putting all the puzzle pieces together. They may have identified Jesus as the Messiah, but they didn't fully understand at the time what that meant. For over 600 years, the Jewish people waited expectantly for God's chosen one who they believed would restore their identity and put an end to their suffering. They believed that the Messiah would be a political leader, a military hero who would save them from Roman occupation. The disciples were all Jewish which means they would have been taught this understanding of the Messiah. This was the lens they saw Jesus through when they first acknowledged him as the Messiah. Now, just a short time before this conversation, Jesus actually told the disciples exactly what was going to happen to him. And we can read all about it in Matthew chapter 20, verse 17 to 19. But I'm just going gonna, gonna to give you a bit of a summary here. He told them that he would be betrayed to the leading priests and teachers of religious law, that they would sentence him to die and hand him over to the Romans to be mocked, flogged, and crucified, and that on the third day he would rise again. Now, I'm not entirely sure how much clearer one can be. But it's it's apparent that what Jesus was saying to his disciples wasn't actually registering with them. Because of the Jewish lens that they saw Jesus through, 
They assumed he was speaking metaphorically, not literally. So despite the words that were actually coming out of Jesus' mouth, they were still convinced that somehow he was going to overthrow the Romans and establish his kingdom on earth. And they wanted to occupy the prominent places of honor in that kingdom. See, the disciples believed at the time, as many did in those days and many do today, that greatness was directly connected to one's social status or how much money or power one possessed. But Jesus quickly turns the tables on this worldly idea of greatness. He says to them in Matthew chapter 20, verse 25 to 28, you know that the rulers in this world lord it over their people and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you, it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant and whoever wants to be first among you must become your slave. For even the son of man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus is making a clear distinction between how the world operates and how the kingdom of God operates. And he specifically speaks to how those in positions of power treat people under them. Jesus says that the rulers of this world lord it over their people and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. They are driven by pride and arrogance. They regard themselves as being better than everyone else. So they look down on others and treat them as lesser humans. Now before we label this a secular problem, let me just say that this problem exists within the church. I've seen this. Pastors and parishioners are as susceptible to these attitudes and actions as politicians are. Because the moment we regard ourselves as being better than someone else, we end up treating that person as our subject rather than someone who is created by God, loved by Jesus, and who is highly valued. Jesus makes it clear that the kingdom, that God's kingdom works differently than the world. That the attitudes and the actions of its citizens are different. Jesus describes those who are, in, who are great in the kingdom of God as servants and slaves. Whoever wants to be a leader among you, Jesus says, must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave. Now this would have packed quite a punch in those days considering that servants and slaves were seen as the least in society. But Jesus was making a point. The way up is down. The way up is down. The way to greatness is to clothe the naked, to feed the hungry, to encourage those who are downtrodden, who are, who are feeling discouraged in this moment. See, contrary to the world, the way the world thinks greatness in the kingdom of God isn't in the prominent positions we hold or how much power that we have over others, but how well we serve those around us. How well we serve those over us. How well we serve those beside us. How well we serve those below us. Now it's easy to take what Jesus says here to mean that as followers of Jesus, we are just simply to participate in acts of service. 
when the opportunity arises. But Jesus is actually pointing to a lifestyle, an attitude of service, an identity that we are to take up as his followers. He's not just calling us to do acts of service every once in a while. He's calling us to be servants, to live a life of service. Now I find it interesting that in this discussion about the kingdom of God, Jesus doesn't actually refer to himself as king. Nowhere in this conversation does Jesus say, I am a king. He refers himself, he refers to himself as a servant. And what's even more interesting is that when he calls himself a servant, he points to being the suffering servant that the ancient prophet Isaiah spoke about hundreds of years earlier. Jesus makes it clear that he came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus is turning the tables. He's redefining greatness. He's challenging the disciples' assumptions about who he is and what he came to do. And he's telling them and us by uh, extension in no uncertain terms who they are to be as his followers in light of who he is as a servant. Among you, it will be different In his letter to the church in Philippi, Paul the Apostle urges the church to have the same attitude Christ had. He writes, though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Actions flow out of attitude. Actions flow out of attitude. Out of his humility and out of his great love for us, Jesus made the choice to lay aside what he could rightly cling to. He made the choice not to lord his power and his glory over us when he most certainly could have. He made the choice to enter into humanity and all that entails, the good, the bad, and the ugly, to die a criminal's death on a cross. All so that we could live all so that we could enjoy full access to the presence of God again all so that we could be forgiven healed and set free Jesus didn't come to lord it over people or flaunt his authority over all those under him he came as a servant, and in light of who he is, we are called to be servants to each other and to those around us with the same attitude as Jesus. Serving others must flow out of an attitude of humility and love. To serve like Jesus means we must copy his posture, his mindset, not just his actions. Now being a servant is hard as it requires a constant death to self, to our pride and our selfishness. But thankfully, we have the help of the Holy Spirit. We need to lean into the Holy Spirit for guidance, for strength, for wisdom, 
And we need the Holy Spirit to constantly examine our hearts and convict us of any wrong attitudes so that we can repent of those attitudes and align ourselves with Christ again. See, with the help of the Holy Spirit, we can be the servants that Jesus calls us to be. Servants who serve without the need for acknowledgement, who serve enemies as freely as friends, who turn the other cheek, who go the extra mile, who are okay with being inconvenienced, and who gladly lay aside our rights for the sake of others. With the help of the Holy Spirit, we can live differently. Author and pastor Scott Sauls once wrote, the best way to measure your desire to serve is to look at how you respond when someone treats you like a servant. It's a great litmus test. Jesus challenged the worldly mindset of the disciples and taught them what true greatness looks like in the kingdom of God. And the good news is, is that the disciples will eventually receive a significant aha moment where the pieces of the puzzle will all come together and they will understand fully what Jesus meant when he said, among you, it will be different. So practically, what does this look like? What does it look like to be a servant while living in the world? To answer this question, I'd like to tell you a little uh, a bit about my friend Connie. We're not going to read about her on Wikipedia or watch a Netflix documentary about her life. We won't even find her on Facebook or Instagram. No books have been written about her life nor will we find any cinematic retelling of the highs and lows of her life. She is most likely a woman that no one here has ever even heard of. Connie was a lovely older Christian lady who lived in a basement suite next door to the house I grew up in. She was a widow and had moved in with her son and his family. My little sister and I frequently played with her grandkids who were around the same age as we were. She would often be seen sitting outside on the porch, knitting and softly humming a hymn. As time passed, my parents got to know her and soon Connie was coming over to our house for dinners and spending time with our family. My mother didn't drive, so Connie often volunteered to drive her to places she needed to be. The grocery store, doctor's appointments, hair appointments. Connie would drive me to all my specialist appointments. As often as she came over to our house, Connie's door was always open to us, no matter what. I remember a time when my sister Eva <laughs> was babysitting my little sister Deborah and I. It was stormy that night and the power had gone out. Eva thought that this would be a great opportunity for her to scare us. And she did this by pointing out the noises in the house and questioning whether it was someone trying to break in. She did such a fantastic job scaring us that she actually freaked herself out in the process. And soon after that, she told us to grab our coats and we headed off to Connie's house. We knocked on her door <laughs> and true to her nature, she welcomed us with open arms and a little chuckle. While we were there, the power came back on but we were still too afraid to go home, so she made us hot chocolate, and we watched Salty the Singing Songbook until my parents came home. That's a throwback. <laughs> Whenever Connie came over, she would position herself at the kitchen sink after dinner was done, and she'd wash all the dishes. 
My sisters and I often joined her. Connie spent a lot of time with our family. And she saw the good and the bad and the ugly. But she never judged us. She never distanced herself. She never gossiped. Instead, she was a constant presence, holding a space for us to feel what we needed to feel. Connie was a shoulder to cry on and a person that I as a child would often confide in. She never forgot a birthday and she was always ready to celebrate with us whenever something good happened to us. Connie was a woman who constantly lived with an attitude of Christ-like humility. She knew who she was in Jesus and she loved without limits. She died several years ago. And I'm convinced that when she stood before God, she heard the words that we all hope to hear one day. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Connie's life was defined by her love for Jesus and her service to others. So when I think of what it looks like to be a servant, I think of Connie. And I hope that now you will too. As followers of Jesus, we are called to live differently. To treat those around us with love and respect, no matter who they are, no matter what they've done. We really have no right to look down on others or treat them as lesser humans. Because in the kingdom of God, everyone is important. I'd like to end this message with a prayer. It's a short and simple prayer that I came across in a book I was reading called The Celebration of Discipline by Richard Foster. I wanna challenge us all to pray this prayer every morning with an open and willing heart and then go about our day and see what happens. It goes like this. Lord Jesus, as it would please you, bring me someone today whom I can serve. Amen. Thank you very much, Rebecca. What a beautiful description of what it means for us to be in the kingdom of heaven and living out this Zoe life. And serving others is uh, our, our call and a representation of that is the beautiful life of Jesus Christ. I want to encourage you now to uh, bring the elements uh, before you for communion. The bread and the cup as we uh, participate now in the Lord's Supper. I want to call the worship team to join me as well as we take part in this act of worship. You know, we've been talking about the kingdom of heaven and we've been talking about the Zoe life. And we have learned this morning again a piece of that kingdom of heaven experience for us. And we're living out the Zoe life. We are serving God and we are serving others. We've been learning about the new creation life then, haven't we? Which began with Jesus Christ. He is the first fruits of this new creation. Up from the grave he arose, and in this incredible moment of the resurrection, new life began, the new era, the era of the gospel, the era of Jesus Christ, alive as first fruits in this new kingdom. Well, as we are approaching the table then, we are participating and partaking in this new creation life. It's amazing for us to think that we are regularly partaking and tasting this new creation life that Jesus Christ has begun with. And so we are taking in this new creation bread. We are taking in this new creation cup. 
We partake and then we live out, as Rebecca has reminded us this morning from Matthew 20. We live out this new creation life as his agents. And we are doing this uh, this morning, participating because he has called us. And so uh, for you who are believers in Jesus Christ, you are called to the table today to partake in this new creation life. Let's pray together. In this moment, I want to encourage you to come before the Lord and humble yourself, as we've been reminded this morning. The last shall be first. The greatest among you must be a servant to all. And Jesus himself did not come to lord it over us, but he himself gave his life up for many. So we humble ourselves before you, Jesus. We have you in our mind's eye right now, and we bow before you. Oh, Jesus, thank you so much for serving us by sacrificing your very life so that we might be free. This morning, Lord, we partake of this new creation life that you have won, that you have gained, and we partake of this, Lord, with great joy in our hearts. It's amazing to us, Lord. And we desire, Lord, to move forward as your agents. And so, Lord, as we partake of this, we ask for renewal. We ask for nourishment, Lord, by your Holy Spirit and a strengthening. As we've been reminded today, your Holy Spirit strengthening us to live out this Zoe life. I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. I'd like to read from Matthew chapter 26, the Last Supper passage, which says this, as they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples saying, take this and eat it for this is my body. And he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them and said, each of you drink from it for this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. This is the body of Christ broken for you. This is the cup which represents his blood shed for you. Church, take this and remember him. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.